This is my friend Kim White. She is the natural naturalist. Today she is working as my assistant, but she has her own show too. She has her own animals, so uh, she'll have to talk to uh, Miss Catherine um, after the show because she's got some unique animals too, like a Patagonian cavey. Yeah. So some cool things. So and I'll come up with her and be her assistant then. <laughs> so anyway, so um, we met through a mutual friend. Kim worked at the zoo for 20 years. I've been doing bat talks for 25 years. So both of us have a long, long relationship with animals. Um, both of us have loved animals, and um, and, and in doing this, we've learned a lot about them. Uh, and one of the things here at, at a library here, I've got to get that little uh, boost right now. Um, after my talk, I hope that you focus in on one of the animals, okay? So pick one of them that you're the most interested in, and then I want you to go into the library and bug those uh, children's librarians and say, I want books on this animal, okay? And let them get you as many books as they can on those animals, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, so you can learn more about them, okay? So, um, my, so okay, my name is Sharon Peterson. Um, my job, my regular job, is I'm a school librarian. I work for a K-5 um, building in um, called Oakley School in Bolingbrook, yes. Illinois. I'm from the New Lenox area, which is by Joliet, but I was born and raised in Chicago. So, and uh, but Lake Geneva, which is not far from here, was kind of my second home from the time my daughter uh, entered camp at Lake Geneva Youth Camp till um, through way through high school for both my kids. So in college, actually. So um, I worked in the Nature Center there. So has anyone here ever gone to Lake Geneva Youth Camp at all? You know where it's at in Lake Geneva? Okay, well, it's a great youth camp, so if you haven't gone there, it's a great, great uh, camp to go to. But uh, anyway, so let's get started. So we're, today we're going to talk about animals from around the world. I have bats, so that's going to be one of our main focuses. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the other animals, too. And you're going to learn a lot of things about So if you've got questions, I will take questions. Um, just wait till there's like a pause in my talking and I'll kind of give you a, a chance for questions then, okay? Um, but let's go ahead, we're gonna start with bats and, uh, and then we'll move on from there. So first off, the bats that I have are not the kind of bats you'd see here in Wisconsin. You've got about nine species here in Wisconsin. We have 12 in Illinois. Uh, the the bats, bats we have in common would be a little brown bat, a big brown bat, and a, and a um, evening bat. And we also would have in common the hoary bat, the red bat, and the silver hair bat. And then you would have the same bat, the northern long ear myotis. You'd have a bat called the American perimyotis. And you would have one more bat. Mm, might, mm, what's the other bat that you would have in common? All right, I forget the other one's name. But then the three bats you would not have, you would not have the gray bat. They're only in southern Illinois. You would not have Raffinesque's bigger bat either. That's all, also in southern Illinois. And I don't know if you get the Indiana bat. Um, so I think maybe that's one bat that you would not get. So we have 12 in Illinois, you have nine up here. So what do the bats in Illinois and Wisconsin have in common? They all eat insects and they're all tiny. The bats I'm gonna show you today are large. They are not found around here, they're from Africa. And I'm gonna get one out now. Give me a second here to. And they like to eat oh it. Oh my gosh! They were trying to feed them come cantaloupe on. before. Come on, come on. And he's like, you gotta come out. He's like, no, don't make me. Right? Ma, yeah, no, it's so embarrassing. I need to make the case shorter <laughs> because it's like so long, and I got long arms, but it's just okay. like they're they're. It's, it's like, oh, honey, honey, okay, there you I go. Got, I got, oh, I got, no, 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 I, uh, uh, no, 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 stop. Stop. She, Stop. Okay. she has, I think, no, at he least does three. Fly. So I have to be very careful with him um, and uh, because he could fly away from me. But fortunately, if he flew away from me, he would not fly much about this far off the ground. I've seen it happen before. He got loose from me one time. Kim was with me again with that one. We went running after him. Uh, but he flew kind of like a frisbee and then he dropped about 100, 100, 100 feet away. Um, because in, he does fly, but again, in the uh, wild, he would have you know, the ability to fly high in the sky and all that, and for long distances. But because he lives in a flight cage in my garage, never been in the night sky, he was always, he was born in captivity, always been in captivity, he has not developed his muscles like a marathon runner has, okay? So just like, you know, I can run, but you know, I'm gonna peter out really quickly. Um, you know, I maybe can get to the front of the library and then I'm gonna be like panting because I'm not used to marathon running. Uh, same thing with him. He would stop flying pretty quickly and he'd be panting in that because he's not used to that long distance flying. Now, Kim has in her hand an Egyptian fruit bat. Both of these bats are from Africa. If you can see both their faces, turn them this way too. They look like little uh, flying foxes, as they're called. They look like little dog-like faces, okay? They've got long, slender snouts. Um, they have, uh, you know, smaller ears. Their ears are not, you know, not very, very big, actually. Um, they've got large eyes, okay? 
So these bats are bats that are going to use their vision, their night vision, to be able to find nectar and fruit. These are fruit bats. They only they're drink gonna be nectar best and they eat fruit. I like that you're smiling so for these the are camera. not bats that are going to be, um, they're not bats that are going to be going after insects. They do not eat insects. And uh, we might have to move my tables into the shade if the sun's going to be beating down like that because they're going to get too hot. Yep, we can do that. Here. But anyway, so we might have to do that um, in, in a second here. But anyway, so um, these these bats, okay, so fruit bats um, are in the family, they're all, all bats are in the family called chiroptera, which means hand wing. Um, fruit bats are called mega bats, and then the bats we have around here are called micro bats. Okay, and the I mega and the micro is not the physical so size the, of the bat, uh, it's actually the eye size of them. Mega bats have large eyes, in uh, the uh, micro bats have That's small eyes. In. Uh, micro She's bats are fence, smaller, but the there are some, the like the Egyptian fruit bat that Kim's walking around with, is actually smaller oh, than some of the uh, larger micro bats. It should be in there, like it's just a giant bat family. They can range as small as my thumb. The thumb will be bad as if we can find that, we don't have to move everything over the table. Up to a bat that has a wingspan that's like my arm span. So there's a bat that has a wingspan like this, okay? Several species. No, no petting it, remember? Large like that. And those bats live in. um, Well, you find fruit bats in Africa, um, Asia, Indonesia, Australia. And not in the New World. Hold on, just be patient. Can you, here, can she okay? see real quick? So the Americans have it. fruit bats, but they're micro bat fruit bats. Okay, they're smaller fruit bats. They're not these kind. They don't have the dog like faces so much. They have little nose leaves on their noses. These little protrusions on their noses. So um, anyway, so but they do the same thing. All fruit bats, what they do is they first will pollinate the flower. And then after the flower is pollinated, then they will, let's see, it's way too bad. After the flower is pollinated, then they will eat the fruit, okay? So he's got about a two and a half foot wingspan. Sorry, I'm here, sweating like ridiculous. <laughs> um, I just sent my um, Don't get in the cord my here. paging. Yeah, She's going to try and bring out our little pop-up right. tent. Yeah, tangle in the cord so right if now. she can find it, we won't have to move the tables. <laughs> but anyway, so um, but anyway, so he's called a straw-colored flying fox. Okay, a straw-colored flying fox. He's a boy because you can see the golden ruff he has around his neck, this golden color there. And also, that tells you that he's a male male bat. The females do not have that. Um, and uh, there's his wings back there. And when he's flying, he's using his arm, okay? So the bat's family name is called Chiroptera. It means hand wing. And so their whole arm is actually um, like a human arm. They have a thumb. They have... Nope. Not this one. Food. You'll get a chance to pet some other ones. Oh, hey, honey, don't be scared. We have tables, or if you'd like some chairs, you're welcome to those. It's fine. All right, so here we go. All right, so anyway, so. Um, Do you guys want to see? Fly with their arms. So they have a thumb like we have. They have four fingers. Their fingers are long, and they have two joints just like our fingers have. And then, of course, they're attached to the membrane to his ankle. So the membrane goes from his, um, from his fingers all the way down to his ankle, and that allows him to fly. They're the only mammals that fly. Okay, you may have heard of flying squirrels and flying lemurs that they only fly, they do not fly. I have a gliding animal here to show you kind of like that, what the, how the gliding works, okay? But this is a true flighted uh, mammal. Um, and uh, there's a lar second largest order of mammals. So we talk about mammals. The largest order are mice, rats, rodents, so kind of uh, the rodent uh, family about 1,500 different kinds of rodents, and there are over 1,200 different kinds of bats in the world. So they're the second largest, um, they're the second largest um, family of mammals, okay? Um, so what does, um, what, how, why is it important that a bat eats fruit and drinks nectar and all that? Well, they are a key pollinator of over 500 plant species. Okay, so there's 500 different plants around the world that bats are responsible for pollinating oh, that and doing feels good. Some of these that breeze feels good. Like bananas, mangoes, papayas, um, things like, um, if you like chocolate, the, the cacao tree that we get chocolate beans from. Bats are one of the pollinators, not the sole one, but one of them. If you're an adult and you like to have a margarita every once in a while, tequila is solely pollinated by bats. So bats are really key. In our desert uh, corridor, um, our deserts of, uh, of uh, North America, we have cactuses. You've heard of the Sororo cactus, the largest cactus, right? And uh, the uh, sorrel cactus, the pipe organ cactus, the agave, which is a, a desert plant, but not really a cacti. Um, all of these plants are pollinated by bats. The flowers are active at, uh, reproductively active at nighttime, and bats are the key pollinators of those plants. So bats are really important in pollination, and then seed dispersal. If you eat a thing like a strawberry, right, 
So let's say a raccoon eats a strawberry. Strawberries have tiny seeds on the outside. Those seeds will end up going out in their poop, and then when it gets, they're scat, we call it, when it gets dropped, and then it will grow into new plants. So a lot of, of pla a lot of plants, oh, thank you. A lot of plants have, um, have a way of what's called seed dispersal, and if they have tiny seeds, the animal that eats it, those seeds will pass through their body and go out with their guano, their cat, whatever it is, um, and be, be, go in different areas and grow in different areas then. So bats are really key seed dispersers for a lot of tropical plants. So in our rainforest area, when people cut down the rainforest, bats are the only animal in the rainforest that will fly over those cut areas, dropping those seeds and causing reforestation to happen. 95% of the rainforest is reforested because of bats. So that's one of the essential things that fruit bats do for us. Now, in the micro bat family, okay, a lot of other things are happening. So you've got bug eating, okay? So first off, what's the most dangerous animal in the world? <coughs> uh, let's see, yes or late? Okay, a lion. Okay, a young man, okay, a lion, okay? Lion, I, I certainly wouldn't want to go up to a wild lion. Okay, for sure, okay? How about you? Mosquitoes are tiny. They can carry But they're so tiny. But they still carry Oh, wait, 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 wait. She's on to something. They carry diseases. Yeah. Okay? So where do you think mosquitoes do the most harm at? What part of the world? Would it be a part of the world like where we are, where we have winter time and mosquitoes are not around? Or would it be close by the equator where it's hot all the time? Yeah. Yeah. So how about Africa and Asia? About a million people die every year, unfortunately from malaria, encephalitis, red fever, yellow fever, dengue fever, Zika virus, West Nile virus, all these type of viruses um, are carried by mosquitoes, so she's absolutely correct. You think of, you know, we think of these big animals like sharks and these tigers and bears and, 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 and venomous snakes like the black mamba. Yes, they're dangerous, but how often do we come in contact with them? Never, right? But mosquitoes are everywhere. Now, are mosquitoes, should we get rid of all the mosquitoes in the world? What if we could make a wish? And we can, our wish could say all mosquitoes were just gone. Would that be a that good would, thing? That would no. ruin the. That no. Would be bad. That would ruin right, it would be bad, exactly, because every animal has a purpose. Every animal has a purpose. So it is not the male mosquito that bites you, it's only the female Don't mosquito. And she does it to lay eggs. That's why whenever it's getting ready to rain, right after a rain that time, we, we get bit more often by mosquitoes because. She's getting ready to lay her eggs in water when the, when the puddles form in that, okay? They lay their uh, eggs in stagnant water. They'll lay their eggs in rain gutters. They'll lay their eggs in bird, pit, bird baths, things like that. There are still waters, okay? And so when they do that, it's uh, the male mosquito, what's, what do you think he's doing? What does he do for food? Well, he and the female actually drink nectar. They're pollinators. So we don't want to get rid of mosquitoes. They're pollinators. But we still want to keep them in check, okay? And how we do that is with a, a healthy, balanced ecosystem. You want everything there. So you want when the mosquito is in its larval form, when it's in the water before it turns in and pupates into the flying insect that we know, you want um, you want aquatic uh, things like fish and uh, and uh, frogs and things like that eating those eggs. Okay. You want then you want birds and bats eating them when they're flying, and that's a balanced ecosystem. So bats play a role in that balanced ecosystem. How many? Mosquitoes can a little brown bat eat in one night? I'll give you four, I'll give you three guesses, okay? And then we'll just do it, okay? A, a thousand. B, uh, 200. Three, uh, I'm sorry, wait, A, C, <laughs> 5,000, okay? So you have 1,000, 200, or 5,000. What do you think it is? Yes? 5,000, you are correct. 5,000 mosquitoes per night per bat. Now, Mosquitoes are a problem, yes, and so we know bats are out there eating them and other animals are eating them too. But another problem that we have in North America and other parts of the world is we have a thing called crop pests. We have um, insects like moths that will eat, um, that will eat, crop, uh, uh, eat our crops. So what happens is like a corn moth, let me get the shade here, sorry, I gotta get the shade, it's really hot. So a corn moth, okay, will go out and um, in huge hordes of them will fly out at nighttime. Moths are n nighttime uh, creatures mostly. They'll fly out at nighttime. They'll fly over to a field of corn and they'll lay their eggs on the corn. Well, those eggs are going to turn into a larva. The larva are then they're going to be hungry. Well, why the mother lay them on the, on the corn? Because she wants them to eat the corn. That's what she's doing. It's a corn borer moth. They will bore into the corn, eating the corn, and then when we go to harvest it, it's ruined, okay? But we don't want that to happen. So we want, we want to 
do something about this. So we use pesticides. We put chemicals on our, our plants or the farmers grow to keep the insects away. But bats, by eating a I lot of these moths, save us over several billions do of dollars in pesticide usage. So bats are really important for that. You're getting, she wants some water. She wants some water. You want to get some water out there? So anyway, so bats are really important for, um, for eating a lot of crop pests too. There's a cave called Bracken Cave. It's in, um, you know, it's a little thing of water. There's a little thing of water. So anyway, um, it's getting really warm. So I'm, I'm really being conscious about my animals needing water. You know, that they're, that's, uh, he, might, he was licking it. I think he needs a little water there. So anyway, so um, Bracken Cave is in Texas. You want some water? I will. Okay. 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 All right. Anyway, Bracken Cave is in Texas. Bracken Cave is a cave that's located by San Antonio. Now, that cave in San Antonio is a protected cave. It's owned by Bat Conservation International. It's protected, which is a good thing, because that's the largest colony of bats in the world. Every year, 10 million, million mother bats come to that cave, and they come there to have their babies. So if there's 10 million mother bats, how many babies are there going to be? 10 million babies. 20 million bats in that one cave. That one group of bats goes out every single night to eat, eat bugs. They eat the equivalent weight of 22 Asian elephants in weight of bugs, that one cave. There's also other places like uh, the Congress Avenue Bridge, which is the largest urban colony, 1.5 million bats, right in the heart of um, Austin, Texas. And then you have uh, Carlsbad Cavern in New Mexico and other places ar around that area yeah. where these bats are congregating in large numbers and they're going out eating crop pests. So they start flying early in the evening, and they would go out in hordes. But if you were at Bracken Cave, it would look like a tornado coming out of the cave, and it takes several hours for them all to get out. Now, while bats are trying to do their thing and eating bugs or, or pollinating uh, flowers or other things, there are predators they have to worry about. What do you think might want to eat a bat? Let's raise your hand. Tell me what you think. What might want to eat a bat? What's a predator? Yes. Wolves are not a predator of bats because bats are flying at nighttime. Wolves would not be, unless unless the wolf the bat fell to the ground. If the bat was on the ground, the wolf would eat it, sure. But let's think about things that are flying nighttime animals too. It has to be a nighttime flying animal or, or something like that at nighttime. Yes. Eagles. Okay, eagles are not flying at nighttime. Though. What's the bird that flies at nighttime? Huh? Owls. 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 The great horned owl. Yes, owls. Owls fly at nighttime. They've got night vision, right? Like like the bats do. Same kind of vision like them. And owls are one of the biggest predator of bats. The great horned owl, especially. Okay, they can catch bats flying. Um, all right. And then another predator you might not think about is bats have to drink water. And when the way they drink water is they there's a uh, stream of water. Okay, it has to be kind of still a pond or whatever. Bats have to fly over that pond dip their mouth in and fly off again. Now, if they fall in the water, they can swim. The little brown bat thinks they can all swim, but they're gonna have a hard time because there's gonna be things wanting to eat them. There might be a fish that wants to eat them. There might be something else, a frog. Bullfrogs also eat bats. When bats are flying over the water to get their drink, a bullfrog can stick its tongue out, whap it, and, and bring it to it, and then swallow it, okay? The bullfrog can eat them as well. So bullfrogs, all, all kinds of birds, even um, herons, I think so little heron can eat them. Um, so we've got a lot of birds that eat them. There's also, like the bullfrog, there are snakes. There are snakes that will hang by the mouth of the cave, and they're, they're dangling, they're hanging by their tail, they're dangling, and when a bat goes by them, if they can grab them, they will. Uh, there's also these big centipedes, they're really big. They hang from the ceiling of the cave, and they can also catch bats and eat them as well. There's spiders that can catch them in their webs and eat the bats too. So bats have predators to watch out for. So there's this whole predator-prey relationship. Now, we know about, I told you fruit bats, I told you bats eat in insects. What else can a bat eat? Other types of bats, what can they eat? Yes? Uh, cow's blood? Okay, vampire bats, good, yes. There are three kinds of vampire bats. Uh, the white white uh, winged vampire bat, the hairy leg vampire bat, and then one called the common vampire bat, and that drinks the blood of cows, pigs, tree sloths, whatever it can find, okay? Whether it's a domestic animal in a pen or it's a wild animal in the rainforest area. Uh, vampire bats only live in the Americas, so you'll find them in Mexico, you'll find them in Central and South America, and the islands in the Caribbean, okay? You will not find them in Transylvania. All right, Hollywood has done a lot um, of damage to uh, animals by depicting them as these horrible things. Like there was a movie called Bats where they had, oh, this bat was genetically modified and it left the lab and now it's terrorizing this town, whatever. 
no, 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 no. So bats have gotten a bad rap for a lot of reasons like that. But bats truly are not an animal that will attack you. They don't go after you. You're not a food source for them. A vampire bat could bite you and drink your blood, but only if you're sleeping in the rainforest. And I'm sure that there are many more things to worry about than a vampire bat, right, Miss Kim? Like an anaconda. Or um, is the fleur de lis uh, bat, is that, uh, the uh, snake, is that in uh, South, Central America, right? South America, yeah? Oh yeah, the insects, exactly. I would be too, exactly. So there's lots more to worry about than just a vampire bat, okay? Now, what a vampire bat does, I'm gonna put him away for a second here, unless you wanna take my, I'll, I'll do a for you if you wanna take my gloves and walk around. Take my hand, okay, give him a chance here. Okay. So I'm gonna need two children who are like brother, sister, or whatever kind of thing. You got a friend? I need two kids. Like, they're, 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 Okay, and who's your friend, sister, whatever? Um, sister, Emma and me are sisters. Okay, all right. Well, it's just a little sister. thing here. You want to come up here? Is she too shy? Is she too shy? You want to come up here? Well, no. Emma and me, Emma and me. All right, you guys, right, so listen, young lady, young lady, come here. Come here, you're just going to be two strangers, that's fine. All right, coming up here. Okay, that's fine. All right, now turn around and look at the audience. Okay, so we're going to be vampire bats for a second. Everyone's a vampire bat, all right? Now, let me tell you what a vampire bat does. So first off, a vampire bat's small. It fits in the palm of my hand, very small. All right, they're not big animals. They have noses that are very flat and pig-like, and that nose is very special. Scientists have found out a lot of information about vampire bats through studying them, and one of the things they found out is the vampire bat has a nose that has heat detectors in it. Now, what is a heat detector? Well, if I were to take um, an infrared detecting um, instrument that detects heat, um, they use these, for instance, like when, um, like, like when a building caves in and they're trying to find people, okay? They can point this at uh, a, the building and see where there's people there because they can see hot spots, okay? So there's uses for this, infrared uh, heat technology. Well, they know that bats have this technology in their noses because a bat can tell where the hot spots are on a person where the blood's close to the surface. And it's going to be around the neck, it's going to be around the wrist, it's going to be around the ankle, all right? So a vampire bat only goes to a sleeping animal. So it's gonna land by the animal. So let's say this, that we're vampire bats and everybody here is a big corral full of uh, horses, okay? And they're all and all the horses are just laying around or standing, sleeping or whatever. So we would land, we would crawl over, crawl onto the animal, uh, try not to wake it up. And then we would go to that spot, like around the ankle, around the, the neck area, around the um, tail area too, okay, those hot spots. And the first thing we would do is if there's hair in the way, we would nip the hair, kind of cut the hair with our teeth, um, very sharp little teeth, and then we would lick the skin to soften it. There's a numbing agent in their, their saliva. That means it makes it um, so it, you don't feel the bite. So they lick, and it softens that area, and numbs it, and then they make the little bites really quick. Kind of like if you go to the doctor and they prick your finger to get blood from it, same kind of thing. Now, the animal doesn't wake up, it's still sleeping, and the blood starts to flow. Well, there's another chemical in the bat saliva that the scientists have been able to isolate get, and, and say, okay, what it is. And it is a, a chemical they have named desmodoplase. But they also call it a fun name called draculin. Okay, so that's a fun name when they say draculin. They found out this enzyme. What this enzyme does in their saliva, sorry, it makes the blood keep on flowing. It's a blood thinner, all right? So they lick it and they're drinking it and they drink about a tablespoon of blood. That's all. It's a very small amount of blood. It's not gonna harm the animal. The only bad thing is that if they have rabies, if the bat has rabies, which can happen, they can transfer the rabies to that mammal then. That's the only bad thing about it. Um, it's, otherwise, they're not really harming the animal. Now, girls, we are vampire bats, and we went out and got blood, but unfortunately, you did not get any. So we went to a cow or a horse or pig or whatever, we got blood. You decided to go into the rainforest for something more exotic for tonight. You were like, oh, I've had that before. I want to try like a tree sloth or something. So you did not get any blood, all right? So this is the dilemma here now. When you come back into the cave, let's say you didn't get blood last night either. So there's two nights out, you did not get any blood, okay? So you're really, really hungry. If you go a third night without blood, you could die, okay? About three nights is all they can last without getting a blood meal. So now you've got to get a blood meal. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to one of us. And let's say that she's like, you know, a closer family member to you. So you're going to have to ask her for blood. Now I'm going to tell you what you would do if you were a vampire bat, but you're really not vampire bat, so you're not going to do it, right? We're not going to do it. I'm going to tell you what you would do though, right? So if you were a vampire bat and you wanted a blood meal from her, you would have to set for me today, and I hadn't thought about this before. Has anyone ever had their dog try to lick them on the mouth? Yeah. yeah. You know your dog is saying, you feed me. Yeah. Your dog's saying, feed me. Yeah, it's the same thing, okay, saying feed me. And I just hadn't thought about that before Miss Kim said that. I'm like, yeah, you're right, gosh. Okay. So, 
you, he, she, you would lick her in the mouth that saying feed me and then where's her blood at well she ate that blood it's in her tummy right now she doesn't have a doggy bag there's no mini fridge back at the at the, at the cave there it's in her stomach so what she has to do is regurgitate it and don't do it please regurgitate blood into her mouth right so don't that's how you do it out. now it sounds really gross but if you think about it if you think about nature I'm sure we could come up with some other animals that use regurgitation. Think about it. Yeah, what other exactly. animal will go get some food, exactly. fill themselves up, and come back and regurgitate it for sure their babies? Yes? Uh, yes, birds. Okay, definitely. Yes, what are we going to say? Um, Is there another something? Okay, all right. So they're going to regurgitate for their babies. Yes. Owls can't eat bats, but then we're talking about they've eaten something now, now they're going to give it to Ooh. something else, right? Regurgitate means they're going to, like, it's like vomiting, okay? But it's a little different, regurgitate. So Some penguins, snakes, right? okay? Snakes? And even wolves, okay? There's Can lots snakes? of other animals that will use regurgitation. So when a wolf pack goes hunting, they don't take the weak with them. They don't take the young with them. They go out, the, the adults, the stronger ones go out. They will bring down, let's say they bring down an elk, okay? Now they've got this big elk. They're going to stuff themselves. It's going to call, it's called gorging themselves. They're gonna gorge themselves. They're gonna eat so much that it's like, they're almost like sick from it, okay? Then they're gonna come back and disgorge part of their meal. And that's gonna be on the ground there. And then the pups and the grandma and whoever other, other weaker wolves are gonna eat that. Okay. Sounds extremely gross. I'm glad we do not do that. I'm sure you're glad mm -hmm. too, right? But that is a way of nature. So when we look at nature, nature has ways of caring for itself. They can't drag back that carcass. That's too difficult. So this is the way they have to do it. So vampire bats use regurgitation to save each other. And so they're actually very caring and loving with each other. They'll groom each other too. And they're pretty cool that way. So what good does that do for us? Well, vampire bats, we're actually studying that enzyme and they're making heart and stroke patient medicine for us. So they're, they're, that enzyme is going to be synthesized and made into a blood thinner for humans. I actually met somebody at Christ Community Hospital who, um, she came to one of my shows and said, yeah, we're doing clinical trials on it. And that was years ago. So it takes usually about 25, 30 years for something to come to market. And it's about that time now. So hopefully it'll be on the market soon. But anyway, so vampire bats are good. Okay, give the girls a hand for helping me. Thank you, ladies, for helping me. Go take your seats now. Thank you so much. Thank you for not regurgitating. Thank you. Um, anyway, so, so bats do a lot of things. Now, what other kind of bats are there? I'll give you a quick rundown, okay? So we can have other animals. So there are bats that, like I said, drink nectar, eat fruit. Okay, there are bats that eat bugs. But there are, and then vampire bats. But there are also a bat called the palibet that eats scorpions and poisonous centipedes, the big ones. He can get stung, it doesn't bother him. He also drinks nectar too, and uh, in the desert, we found that out not too long ago. There are bats, uh, a bat called the fisherman bat, okay, or the bulldog bat. And what it does is it echolocates on the water, that means sending sound out through its mouth or nose, and it bounces off, comes back to him, and gives him information. Uh, the distance to the water, the, what if there's something moving in the water, whatever, he can tell that. And when he sees the, the fin break, when he hears the fin break the water surface, he can go down there, drag his razor sharp claws through the water, pick up a fish, hook it on his claws, and put it in his mouth and fly away and eat that. There are bats that eat lizards. There are bats that eat spiders. There are bats that eat other bats. There are bats that eat mice, okay, carnivorous bats. So there are bats that eat lots of variety of different things. There are lots of different colors with bats, not just um, brown, okay. Um, my bats, you can see some you know, yellows on them. There's a bat that's um, all white. Uh, in, at, that, it's called the Honduran fruit bat with yellow wings. There's a beautiful bat called a painted bat. It's orange oh, and white and black. It's got really pretty that's colors so on it. Um, there's a lot of different um, sizes to bats. Again, from as small as a bumblebee all the way to a large flying fox um, that has got a six foot wingspan. So variety of sizes, variety of colors, variety of faces on bats. We can have nose leaves, which means a protrusion sticking up or they can echolocate through their, their mouths. So lots of different varieties. I do a, normally I do a bat show that has a PowerPoint presentation showing you a lot of those images. Sorry, I don't have that for you today, but, but, but there's a lot of cool things about bats. Um, another thing is, okay, so bats are not blind. All bats can see. Um, bats do not all have rabies. About half of 1% uh, of bats actually can track rabies, but you can't tell. So never pick up a wild animal. Don't pick up a wild bat. Um, if I found a bat in, in the house, I, I've had a vaccination, but my vaccination is probably gone by now. It's been a while. So I would have to put on some heavy gloves to help move it out and put it back outside again. So a child would not do that, of course. An adult, you could, you know, call me up and then I could help you with that. But, you know, heavy gloves on, uh, to capture it and get it out of the house and that kind of thing. But, uh, and then find out how they're getting in your house, too, because you want to block the entrances. But there's a lot that goes into that, too. I can talk to you about that later. Um, but anyway, so bats will not attack you. They won't get in your hair. That's a myth, too. 
Um, not all bats are vampire bats. Only three of almost uh, 1,200 different kinds of bats are vampire bats, three species. So most bats are insect-eating bats. Then we have those other fruit, nectar, and all those other kinds of bats that do different things. Uh, so anyway, bats are pretty cool. So we're going to go from bats now into another creature that they say is a flying creature, but it's actually a gliding creature. Um, when we hear like flying squirrels, flying weavers, that they're not really flying, they're oh, actually gonna gliding. And I've got them underneath here. So we're going to go to Australia now. I watched the whole documentary. And all right, and this kid is going to get out the uh, shirt glider. But I have uh, two kinds of possums with me today. I have a third one at home, um, the big kind of possum right here. But there are two kinds of possums that I have with me today. One is called a woolly possum that lives in South America, and the other one is called a um, sugar glider. And they're from uh, they're from Australia. But I got to get her out. She's a little nippy sometimes. I got to be careful here. Come here, baby. Come here. Come here. I'm staring at her to say it. Come here, honey, come here. Um, I actually, I don't know. Here we go. Oh, no. Oh, I can't see her. Oh, All right, so this is calling us to have a shade because this is too hot in the sun. Okay, so what I've got in my bag right now is called a South American bear tail woolly possum. I can't see. So part of her tail, which is longer than her body, it can actually go to 18 inches long, is nude. It doesn't have any hair on it. So that's where the bear tail comes into it. It is a prehensile tail. Prehensile means it can use it to grab things and hold on to things. So what she can do is when she wants to eat something, so she's climbing around in the tree. She's called an arboreal animal. She lives in the treetops, okay, all the time. Um, and uh, very seldom would go to the forest floor in the rainforest in, in South America. She um, has nocturnal, so she's got the big black eyes, and I'll turn around here so we can see her there, so you can see her. And uh, so what she would do is she'd climb around in the trees looking for insects. She eats a lot of insects, but she'll also eat some vegetation. She'll eat uh, some, uh, like the, the tree bark, the underneath the tree bark, the acacia, or the, um, uh, uh, the gum underneath the tree bark. She would, um, I gotta be careful with her because she can run away from me and get lost here. Come here, honey. Come to the, she won't come to the front of me, that's the problem here. Come here. Anyway, she would um, eat um, a lot of bugs, and um, and she would also eat, like I said, uh, she'd put pollinate too and eat fruit. So a variety of a diet, not just insect uh, insectivorous. Um, anyway, but she's um, yeah, she's she's new. I just got her a little while ago, so she's still very young. She's not a year old yet. And she's a little nippy sometimes, so I gotta be careful with her too. I can't just grab her like I would with sugar gliders. Now what Kim has are the sugar gliders. So this is from South America, a type of possum. The similarity between them are these guys, they both have ears that are nude, kind of a little bit of fur on them only. They have the same kind of feet. Their, their, their back feet are actually a hand, and they're um and they um can also hang upside down. So when she goes to eat something, she can grab something. And she can hold on with her tail and her back feet while she's hanging upside down eating it with her hands, okay? So she's called a bear-tailed woolly possum. Her name is Wendy. And uh, there she is. A better view of her there. I got your tail. I got your tail. Hold on. Hold on. But uh, anyway, she's young, though. So she'll get bigger. She'll go um, probably like not double the size of this, but she'll get much bigger. Her tail, like I said, 18 inches long. Her body will be 12 inches long. So she's still very young right now. Um, so these are marsupials, too. That's, I didn't tell you that yet. They're marsupials. I mean, they have a pouch, and they um, marsupials, um, when they just ate their babies, it's only for about 13 days, and then the baby has to come out and go into the mother's pouch, and there's little, um, there's uh, feeding tubes in there for it to feed from, and it will grow inside the pouch then for the remaining type of its development, um, which is, there, that's one type of mammal. So marsupials are a type of mammal. We're a placental type of mammal. That means we grow the entire time until we're able to survive outside of our parent. Um, whichever, it may be a cat, a dog, a human, whatever. And then there are myotremes which come from eggs. So the, duck, uh, the ducal platypus and the echidna actually lay eggs, and their babies hatch from an egg. They're a type of mammal too. So mammals are a very different uh, kind of variety of family, uh, or an interesting family of, of, of animals. And we're in that particular family too. We're mammals as well. So anyway, um, all right, so sugar gliders are from Australia. And the unique thing about them is they glide. Now I'm going to just walk around and talk to you about this. They glide from tree to tree. They have skin that goes from their wrist to their ankle. And what they do is they will take, uh, spread their arms out, 
and jump off of the tree, spread their arms out, and they can glide. Now, they're not going to go up. They're going to be going down. Gravity's going to be pulling on them. They don't have true flight. So they're going to be dropping down. But they can uh, manipulate you know, their bodies and, that, and catch little drafts and things like that until they're they about to land where they want to go to. So two things why they do this is one, to get catch prey, and the other is to avoid predators. Okay? Every animal, every single animal, has to always be thinking about that. Find food, avoid eating coming food. Every animal. Uh, there's a few apex predators, um, like the blue whale, for instance, okay? Maybe that one. Um, a wolf is kind of an apex predator, too. So there's a few yeah, apex predators that means that they're like at the top hell. of the food chain. They're like, you know, there's not much there to worry about, um, but, um, but, but for humans, okay, as far as the animals go. But, um, but most animals have to be concerned. Find food, don't become food. That's a daily thing for all of them. Find food, don't become food. And don't have something to fall them in the meantime, an accident or something or whatever else um, happened to them, okay? I'll keep on walking her around right now. You can see her. So is there any questions about my marsupials right now? Any questions about Wendy or about my sugar gliders? Oh, the sugar gliders' names are Buttercup, Blossom, and Bubbles, the Powerpuff Girls. Oh my gosh. So that's the naming contest that we had. And um, and it has, their name sugar glider comes from the fact that they like to eat sweet things. So they'll eat, they'll eat honey, they'll eat nectar, um, but they'll also eat bugs and some vegetation too. They like fruit. Um, and that, but they like sweet things. They're very much liking sweet things. So they like bugs too. And I think we have questions. Okay, there's a question. Okay, young lady first, and the young man. Yes. So this is the coloration for her. I've not seen any other colors for this particular species of uh, of the possum. Um, this this kind of gray with the cinnamon color. That's their normal coloration. Every animal can have variations in color because like with my sugar gliders you see here, um, it's a matter of boys and girls. It's like with people, okay? When you look at all of us, okay, however light we are or however dark we are, we're all of one blood, okay? They did a genome, uh, it was called the Human Genome Project. And that Human Genome Project said that every single person on the planet who's ever lived and whoever will live all come from a woman they named for gender Eve, okay? So one, one woman, we can trace everybody back to her. So we are all related. Whether you, you know, whether we're distant cousins or we're co close cousins, we are all related. We're all of one blood. Okay. Same thing with my, my um, little gliders there. It's a matter of a chemical called melanin. It's either having less of it or more of it, okay? Jamie and I both have um, heritage, my friend Jamie over there, we both have um, uh, European heritage that have like our complexion, okay? She's got Greek in her, I've got French in me, so I have an our complexion, I tan really well. I have Irish in me, but that didn't come out, that didn't express in me, so I'll, whereas, you know, some people have, um, will have a lighter color. Oh, 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 oh. Can it come here? Can it come here? Can it come here? Come here? Come here. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come here. Come here. You can do it. Ah, they're not. This is Buttercup. Buttercup is going to be a little tiny jump if she does it at all. Come on. Come on. Come on. It's going to hurt because she's just getting away from me. Okay. Ah, not a good jump. i got to give her a jump. I've got to train him to jump farther. Oh, there she goes. Okay. This is the problem, okay? I typically don't do outdoor shows because some of my animals can get away from me. And, and she she's expensive. She was like, she was fifteen hundred dollars. So uh, yeah, but I wouldn't want. I don't care how much she costs. I wouldn't want her to get away from me. So she's gonna want to climb up. And from here, it shouldn't be so bad. But I wouldn't be able to get her on top of that. If she could get to that tree and she would climb all the way to the top, I'd never see her again. Or I'd be standing here for hours at the fire department trying to catch her, and I don't think I'd be able to do it. So I gotta be really careful. So I'm holding on to her tail. Yeah. So yeah, exotic animals are very expensive. She's very rare too. It's very, it was very difficult getting, finding somebody who had was breeding them. So, uh, but she's a definitely an exotic animal. Um, some animals like the sugar gliders, you think they're really cute and you want them as a pet. Well, you gotta know about these animals too, though. They're nocturnal, so they're gonna be awake at nighttime, and they're noisy. So one of the noises I hear at nighttime is this noise that goes like this, goes. And it's like constant. <laughs> they, they're, they're barking at each other and, and that kind of thing. So, so animals, you know, you gotta you gotta research them really well before you get them as a pet. I'm gonna put a little bit of other stuff here.
and they can lick their eye to clean it. So they lick their eyeballs so they clear the lens to clean it. Now, this camera, you're going to get out the, oh, you're still walking over right that one. All right, let me get out my other one real quick to show. So my other kind of gecko is a different kind of gecko because it has, it's a desert gecko. So some of the differences with it are this. Let me show you the two here. All right, so the desert geckos have eyelids. He can, he can close his eyes. This is called a leopard gecko. My brother has one of those. Oh, cool, yeah. So the leopard gecko can close its eyelids. The, the other kinds of geckos do not. Leopard geckos have different feet. Their feet are designed to run on sand, okay? Whereas this one's designed to climb in trees. So different kinds of feet, they don't have sticky feet. Um, the leopard gecko has a really fat tail. There's all other ones called fat tail geckos too. They come in lots of different pretty colors too. Um, but anyway, the tail is really important. So for this particular animal, the tail's prehensile. It can hold on to things with it. Again, if it falls off, it grows back, except for the crested gecko, that tail does not grow back. The crested gecko loses its tail, it does not go back. We do not know why, it's, it's really weird. But the, um, the leopard gecko, as you can see, has a really fat tail, and this is important. Think about the rainforest, there's lots of food around. There's always tons of bugs around, there's tons of fruit around, there's tons of flowers all the time, okay? But in the desert, there's very little food. So what they have to do, like a camel, okay, has those humps to store, to store uh, fluids in it. The, the gecko can store energy in its tail, okay? So it can store fat in its tail to survive off of. So the same thing though, the tail can break apart. There are segments to it, it can break apart. And again, if the predator does not eat that tail, it'll eat it itself, and it also eats its skin too. So that's a common with both of these guys, okay? But that tail has storage of, for food in it, okay? Uh, food storage in it, so it can survive. So every animal has a way of avoiding predators. Um, it's called the flight or fl fight or flight response, okay? If you can't fight it, like a lion would fight, but these guys are gonna run, okay, flight. They're gonna take off and get out of there. So there's flight and fl fight and flight kind of animals. So these guys are a flight kind of animal. They get out of there and leave the tail behind, that's fine, because I can grow it back and put, get out and save myself for another day kind of thing, okay? So that's a leopard gecko. The leopard gecko has really bumpy skin. Um, it feels so similar to this, but it's very bumpy instead. And it would camouflage really well into um, the desert floor, okay? So sand and the, and the little uh, grains of, uh, uh, little pebbles and things like that, okay? So let's you walk him around. All right, now I'm going to take out my uh, snake. So I have a fun story to tell you. So about um, last year, uh, over a year ago, I bought a snake. I named her Cornelia. And she was a cute little snake. I really liked her a lot. And my, I bought a special cage for her that has a sliding locking lip because snakes are known as being escape artists, okay? So I bought this special uh, lock on the, for the, the locking uh, thing. Oh, yeah, there she goes. And um, I thought, good, I'm fine now. We're, she's not going to get away from me. I'm not going to be one of these snake owners that has a lost snake in the house, right? <laughs> Didn't count on my cat. My cat walked all over my cages. And she walked on the hatch part. The, it broke in, made an opening, and Cornelia took off. So this is like November, December. She's gone now, right? So then, two days ago, when I went to a birthday party on Saturday, I went to get the snake for the birthday party, and this is my new snake. This is candy corn, all right, and she's a corn snake. When I went to go get her, I didn't see her in her cage. And I'm thinking, I, how did she get out now? Well, what I had forgotten was I had cleaned one of the things in her cage that had uh, a broken part in the bottom, and I had stuffed some paper towels in it. When I went to clean it, I took them out, and I didn't put them back in. So she got up inside of that, didn't know that. So I'm now looking around the room trying to find her. Guess who I found? Eight months later, I found Cornelia. Eight months later, alive. Alive. Hungry and alive. I found her. I gave her two little mice right away. And she's she's in a cage now. She's fine. But I have two corn snakes now, which is I'm happy about. But anyway, but yeah, so it's amazing. She, I thought for sure she had gotten like underneath the refrigerator and in the closet and into the crawl space and she was gone. No, nope, she's in a box, and I don't know how long she's, uh, she must have been getting out, eating crickets that were like loose in the room, because they you know, reptiles, I got lots of crickets around the house, um, and, and then uh, drinking water from the cat bowl, maybe, you know, every night when I'm sleeping, she's out chilling around and going around doing her thing, maybe, I don't know, but, but amazing, I found her alive, so yeah, so if you ever lose a snake in your house, don't give up, you might find it, you know, don't give up, so this is called, this is Cornelia, she's a corn snake, now she's called a corn snake, not because she eats corn, but because that pattern on her underside, this is like, looks like Indian corn, okay? That pattern. Now this snake is a baby still, she's very young. The corn snake at full size adult will be about four to five feet long and about the uh, width of, uh, thickness of a, of a um, 
like a big sausage, okay, uh, thickness. So she's only like the size of like a pencil now, um, or a marker maybe, but she'll be like, you know, about that thick when she's full grown and about four to five feet long. That's it though. Uh, these are snakes that are constrictors. So she um, eats her prey by constriction. Constriction means she wraps around, and when the animal takes a deep breath in, and then it exhales, she goes tighter. The next time it does it, she goes tighter, and eventually the animal can't take a deep breath in anymore. They become asphyxiated. That means that they can't breathe anymore, and then they pass away. And then she would then swallow it whole. Now she can eat mice right now, because she's not that big, but she's eating, uh, she's moving now from the little pinky mice to the fuzzy mice. I feed her a mouse I defrost. And then she will eventually move to hoppers, and then she will move to regular full-size ones. It may may end up being big enough to eat a rat pup. I don't know yet. Uh, but right now she's just on the second second uh, stage of the mice that I can feed her. Uh, call, but she's got beautiful coloring, as you see that. She feels really cool. Uh, one of the cool things that corn snakes can do, it's called a false rattle. So some snakes can do this. Um, and what they do is, when they're in like leaves and stuff like that, they can vibrate their tail very quickly, and it makes a, a rattly kind of sound. It is not, she's not a rattlesnake, she can't, doesn't have venom in her, but she can fool other predators that she may be one. And by rattling her tail, moving it very quickly, making that vibration, she can trick them into thinking that she's venomous. And that's a way she can uh, try to fool her predators. So some animals, if they can't escape quickly, they can try fooling them, and she that, does that with her tail. And there's other uh, snakes that can do that. So, but she's got beautiful coloration, as you can see. Um, and uh, snakes are cool. They don't, they don't feel slimy. You know, of course, they're very dry and scaly. And um, you just got to make sure you hold on to them securely. They want to be, you know, want to feel secure when you uh, are holding them. They don't like their head being touched, so don't touch your head. And um, yeah, but um, if you handle them often enough, they they won't be aggressive. This uh, species is a very non-aggressive type snake, so you always want to make sure you know you handle them often enough, or you're gentle with them in that, so that they do not become aggressive. Okay. And this is a really good, the first kind of animal to have, a uh, snake to have. And then they wait for a predator, a, a pre sorry, prey to walk on top of it, and then they go out and pounce on it. She eats crickets. She could eat a baby mouse too, um, but she, when she gets bigger, but there's um, bigger tarantulas. The biggest one being the Goliath tarantula, and the Goliath tarantula can eat um, birds and bats and mice and rats and things like that. It's really big. It's the size of a dinner plate. Um, one of the things about spiders, though, tarantulas in particular, they have a defense mechanism, and their defense mechanism is kicking hairs. So if you are trying girls if you're um come if you're a predator and you're coming at the tarantula its two back legs can very quickly rapidly like this kick the hairs up into the air so it would go into the face of the of the predator and that would make it itch uh the hairs are very itchy um some tarantulas not this one but some tarantulas when they kick their hairs can blind a person so that's a defense mechanism they kick their hairs okay uh it's a defense mechanism they have eight legs they are, um, and then two legs called petty pals in the front. Those are like hands that they use for food. And then um, when they grow, they have to molt. 
So they're, they come out of their whole exoskeleton. So everything you see here is will be in their second, the, the second uh, in their molt. So when they molt, you have like two spires from it. One's an empty shell though, and the other one's the, the new one. Um, when they molt, they can lose legs. She lost two legs about a year, two years ago now, when she molted. And so it's taken almost uh, this long for them to grow back. They're still not completely grown back, but very soon they will be. The next molt, she'll grow them uh, back fully. So every time she molts, they get a little bit bigger, okay? And how they molt is their top part of their cephalothorax, the middle part here, is like a hatch that pops open. They turn themselves upside down, and they push themselves out of their, their, their husk, their, their skeleton. So when they do that, they're vulnerable for the first 10 days. It takes about 10 days for them to harden fully. Uh, so you don't want to put any food in there while they're, while they're in their molt situation, okay? Until they're fully hardened up, then they're going to be hungry, okay, after that time. They eat crickets. They can eat other uh, insects too. Uh, Dubia roach. Um, again, baby mice if, you, if they're older, bigger, uh, bigger uh, spiders. The lifespan of them, the, this particular spider can live 25 years if it's a female and about seven years, nine years if it's a male. Ma females live longer than the males do. Um, it also has on each leg, there are two toes. So when she puts her foot down on something, her toes spread out and there's two little nails there. So her nails help her to hang on to things. Um, I've got to be very careful with her because if she drops on the ground, she could crack her, uh, her abdomen and that would kill, kill her because she's uh, everything, her skeleton's on the outside, okay? So you've got to be very careful with tarantulas. Um, always handle them over soft surfaces or you know be very careful with them. But anyway, so if you want to, um, Last one I have, oh, I've got two more. Okay, here. So we've got the bearded dragons. I'll hold her for a second. The bearded dragon. The bearded dragon's from Australia. It's a lizard, of course. And um, one of the things about lizards, snakes, all these kind of reptiles is they can't regulate their own body heat. Right now, I'm sweating. That's how I'm regulating my body heat. They do not sweat. So what they have to do is they have to have a cool place and a warm place if you keep them as a pet. In their, within their enclosure, a place where they can get heated up if they want to, like 90 degrees, a place where they can get cooled down, which would be like 70 degrees, okay? So they want to have a hot place and a cold place in, your, in, in their environment, um, so they have to regulate their own heat. Uh, that's why you'll see snakes sunning on, on, on rocks and that kind of thing, okay? Um, so the bearded dragon's from Australia. Um, it eats bugs too. It can also eat small rodents um, and that as well. Um, and um, it has very rough skin. Um, it can run really fast, and the other thing about the bearded dragon is it's called the bearded dragon because underneath its chin, that whole area there, when it gets upset, it puffs it up and it turns black like a beard, like a man's beard. That's why they're called bearded dragons, okay? Um, and that they make a really good pet. Like you can see, that one's called Bodhi. Uh, Bodhi's little backstory is that somebody, when COVID first started and our school dismissed itself and we were going to Zoom meetings and that. Someone dropped him off in front of my school in a box in March Aww. in the cold. Fortunately, my custodian found him. His name is Bodecker, so we named this, this little guy Bodie. I had an aquarium at my school with a heat lamp and all that for my, my other one that I have, Smog. So now I have two of them uh, because of that. I have this little guy that uh, got adopted because I found out in the cold. But anyway, but they're very, he's very friendly, very sweet. Um, Again, he loves he, hornworms, he eats um, super mealworms, but he also eats some vegetation, fruit and uh, some veggies too, um, and that, and uh, pretty easy to care for. You just gotta have a nice, nice long 40 gallon breeder tank and, uh, and uh, heat and uh, UVB, UVA lights for them. Pretty easy to care for. It's great pet, great pet for kids. All right, my last animal. So I talked about how this little guy uh, shoots, uh, throws his hair off. Well, we've got another animal that can spray, but not hair, but sprays a stink. And it's called a skunk. And I'm gonna show you my skunk. I've got my skunk, um, his name is Loki with me today. I've got three skunks, but I've got Loki. And Loki's a special kind of skunk, because Loki has um, is a color that's called lavender. He's got a beautiful kind of uh, beige with a purple tinge fur. And it's called lavender skunk. Come here, Pocky. Come here, come here, come here. Come on, come on over here. Come here. Okay. This is Loki. And Loki cannot spray because when he was a week old, the breeder that I bought him from, because I bought him from a USA breeder, um, you're pulling on my thing here, Seth. He took out his um, stink glands, okay? So there are two glands, so when a skunk sprays, okay, you're pulling this off of me. Okay, when a skunk. 
What they do is there are two glands, so they're small glands of the size of a grain of rice in the beginning of the anus, the same, same place that they go potty out of. And what they do is they just pluck them out. They're not networked in yet. They can't spray yet. So when they do it that young, there's no harm to the animal at that point. If they did it when they were older and they were able to spray, it's more of a surgical procedure then. And it can cause them to prolapse bad things. So basically, um, it's best to do it when they're young. Now, if you buy a skunk in Europe, you can't have them descented. You have to take them intact, able to spray, uh, if you want them as a pet. And there are people that do that. They take an intact skunk as a pet. But, um, but anyway, he's chubby. Just as you're wondering, he is chubby because he always gets a meal. Um, you know, in the wild, a lot of our animals do not always get a meal. Many times, often, there's no meal to be had and they go hungry. Um, what they will do, like in the, in the winter time, he is not a true hibernator. In the winter time, he is going to, when it's really bad weather out, and the chance of getting a meal is like pretty much nil, because uh, nothing else is gonna be going out either because it's so bad. He's just gonna stay in and sleep, sleep and sleep and sleep, and wait for that um, time when it might have some chance of food, all right? Um, um, when it's breeding time, which is in the uh, spring when it's still kind of wintry out, um, he will get out there to, to breed. But um, as far as, you know, as far as uh, getting out there in the winter time, Again, they're going to watch the weather themselves too. And if it's good enough, if it's not a, a nice day, we'll see if we get those days, um, he'll go out and try to find food. So what he will eat are bugs. He will also eat mice. He'll eat fruit, vegetation. They eat a wide variety of things. They can get in your garden and eat some of your garden vegetables even if they want to, like zucchini, things like that. Um, mine love, love zucchini. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're omnivorous like we are. They'll eat a wide variety of stuff. Uh, they can get into a, a hen house, they'll eat some baby chicks, they'll eat the eggs, um, you know, so that happens too. But farmers don't mind having them around, especially if they have a granary, because they will eat, they will eat the mice that, that would be eating the grain, okay? So, so these guys are really good at doing that kind of thing, eating, um, eating mice around farms and stuff, okay? Um, let's see what else about him to tell you. His coloration, again, I was saying about the coloration of the, the sugar gliders. So again, this is a color that is not common in the wild. It can happen, but it's very rare in the wild. But through selective breeding, they can get these colors to come out like they did with dogs, okay, and cats and things. So it's, it's just a selective breeding process. So you can have apricot, you can have lavender like him, you can have all white, you can then you can have also al albinism where they they have pink eyes and they're all white, which is total lack of melanin. Uh, you can have um, the dark black with the white, you can have all black. Kim has a skunk by her house that's a wild skunk that comes up on her deck and tries to eat kitty food for the stray cat she is out there. And he is all black except for a little bit of white on his head, right? Yep. And yeah. Four hairs on the tail. Yeah, so really weird. But again, it can happen, just like with us too, you, you know? It, yeah. Um, in that. So, you know, so the, it's just a matter of how much melanin you have in your system. So genetics is a fun thing. If you're ever a, if you're science minded, that might be a fun field for you to get into. You know? But anyway, so what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna let Miss, um, and I know Catherine. Catherine, yes, Miss Catherine. Uh, my, anyway, I'm gonna let her hold the skunk so you can pet the skunk. She's gonna sit in a chair. Okay, we're we'll getting a chair over here so it makes it easier on you. Sure. And she'll let you pet the skunk. <laughs> Do me a favor though, don't put fingers by his face. He's never bitten anyone, but I don't want him doing that. So just, you know, pet him on the back. And when you go to pet him, you're gonna pet him like this, okay? Stroke from head down like this, okay? Do not do this smushing thing. They do not like that, it kind of hurts. So just go a couple strokes that way, okay? Um, I will take out. Um, Ellen, look at me and smile. It's just like the stone, don't put your And more? All right, you want to get a closer look at That's it? I almost 